Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you for the kind introduction. As uh, ma'am said, insufficient structures are uh, usually, I would say, not very common, but uh, usually an uncommon endoscopic finding during our uh, routine day-to-day uh, -day practice. However, the management of insufficient structures is uh, very, very critical whenever we find such a patient. So I invite the speaker to you know, talk about the topic and then we can you know, follow up with the discussion. Thank you, Bank. So, as uh, uh, Dr. Anjana has already said, today uh, we, we are literally going to discuss a very common topic. Uh, it's a common topic in the sense this is common to both ENT and gastro uh, surgeons. Uh, in terms of uh, routine endoscopy findings, uh, this is not that much common as Dr. Mayak has already say, said. But you tend to get these kind of uh, strictures in very, uh, you know, uh, in if your routine endoscope is, if you don't identify these kind of strictures, we usually miss most of them. So just, we, uh, I will just share my presentation here. Okay. So esophageal stricture, uh, we uh, start with like stricture or constriction. So are both of these same thing or what, what do we say it's a, whether it's a constriction or a stricture. So by definition or by, uh, you know, by nomenclature, stricture and constriction are just like uh, the word tracheotomy and tracheostomy. So in uh, as a nomenclature, stricture is less widely known as a constriction, is a type of abnormal narrowing in a passage in the body. So when we say constriction, we call, talk about in terms of human body, we talk about constriction is a, is a normal physiological narrowing of any lumen. But when we say it's a stricture, then that, that thing is, it's the, the constriction, whether a constriction or an, any other area which has become now narrow. So we don't, uh, we then, then we term it, it as a stricture. So the term is generally used for many types of narrowing, but a stricture is typically formed in an area of muscle that contracts over time and narrows a passageway rather than any other types of narrowing. So we start with basic anatomy of the esophagus. As we all know, so the esophagus is completely divided into three parts. The three parts, it consists of the cervical part, thoracic part, and the abdominal part. So overall length of uh, the esophagus is 23 to 37 centimeter with a diameter of one to two centimeter. The cervical part, it's the, it starts from the lower border, the border of the cricoid cartilage. It's at the level of the cricopharyngeus muscle, C level at the vertebral level of C5, 6. And it, uh, that is the cervical part. And before it, uh, before it enters into the thoracic inlet. So that is the part, uh, this is the cervical part. And the second part, the thoracic part, it's the superior thoracic aperture from the T1 to the esophageal hiatus in the diaphragm at the level of T10. This is, uh, this is the thoracic part. And in the abdominal part, consists of a very smaller part, the esophageal hiatus uh, uh, in the diaphragm and is continuous with the cardia of the stomach at the GE junction. So in, uh, in this whole uh, length, uh, normally we, what we found, we defined is a three natural uh, constrictions. As earlier mentioned, constriction is the natural narrowing of the, any lumen. So here the, there are three, uh, the three normal esophageal constriction not to be confused for pathological constrictions. So we must always keep in mind that the levels of these three constrictions should always be in our mind whenever we do a uh, per the endoscopy. So the first narrowing is the cervical constriction is the narrowest point due to the cricoid cartilage at the level of C5-6 that was just at the beginning of the uh, esophagus. Second constriction we found uh, we find at the level of uh, when when the, the aortic arch 
crosses the esophagus. So that is at the level of T4-5, it's a 23 centimeter from the upper incisor teeth. Then third constriction is the abdominal constriction at the level of the esophageal hiatus, where the diaphragm, diaphragm uh, constricts the part. Uh, then that forms the lower, uh, the third constriction. <clears throat> so I'll just uh, show one video, which will uh, just uh, realize you how, uh, this isn't completely unedited video, so I will just play along. So this is the uh, uh, this is the cricopharynx where we actually before in, insert insertion we almost get blind out. So that is the narrowest part. And then when we go down, this is no, this is we have just here when we see at this level I will just wait. You see you can see there is a constriction here. So this is the constriction where we find the uh, crossing of the arch of aorta. And that is the lower esophageal sphincter. So when we talk about strictures, uh, we mostly encounter with uh, benign strictures, which may be further divided into simple and complex and malignant structures. Malignant structures usually growth or uh, so when we talk about uh, structures that is a simple which the benign structures we will be talking particularly about the benign structures. So benign structures are this is a simple structure or a complex structure. The so simple structures are defined as a focal short that is less than two centimeter in length and luminal diameter should be more than 12 mm. More, most common causes of this kind of simple structures are the peptic structures, the benign peptic structures, the Schatz gearing, the esophageal web, or eosinophilic esophagitis. And when we talk about complex structures, these are defined as the longer structure, which is more than two centimeter in length, or along with uh, luminal diameter of less than 12 mm, the whole uh, structure is irregular, tortuous, or angulated. Common causes are seen in most commonly, it's found in the corrosive injuries. Then the anastomotic structures where post -eso esophageal, uh, for any esophageal anastomotic surgeries, there's structure at the anastomotic anastomosis point. Uh, radiation induced in cases of a malignant tumor is there for which the radiation has been taken. So there may be a radiation induced structure. And ESD endoscopic, uh, the, the, the submucosal procedure is sometimes done for in cases of simple strictures or in cases of echelasia. If we go for uh, endoscopic submucosal resection, so as a part of that complication, it may call, go into the complex strictures. So there is one more uh, variety which is called benign refractory or recalcitrant esophageal structure. So these structures are defined as the, when, when a normal, simple or a complex structure which goes uh, into, a, into a failure because as in terms of uh, persistent, uh, uh, even after persistent you know, dilatation and persistent treatment, if the diameter is not uh, uh, more than 14 mm in five sessions of endoscopic dilatation with two week intervals. These cases are considered to be refractory strictures. So just like this, the stricture is almost there, but even after the treatment, the stricture has not gone. So in that case, the treatment line is completely different. So here I will just uh, discuss the esophageal webs and rings, which we commonly note that is uh, it's there defined as the A ring, B ring, and C ring. A ring is a transient smooth muscular ring above the vestibule. B ring is the Schatzky ring. Schatzky ring, it, it is called as a Schatzky ring when it is a symptomatic ones. It's a very thin mucosal ring at gastroesophageal junction. 
which is most commonly associated with associated with hiatal hernia and the c ring it's the diaphragm diaphragmatic uh, indentation associated with hiatal hernia i'll just go through one video uh, dr mank mank yes yes i'm here uh, so uh, you just uh, i will just discuss with the video uh, you know i'm just playing through, i'm going through so just go through the video and just let me know what do you uh, what is your opinion in that in this particular video in this particular finding this patient presented with you know uh, repeated pain abdomen dysphagia so here we see is this what we call we can call what, what do you think it it is we can we can call this a shard gearing actually this is a typical shard gearing because it's yeah, not yeah, going yeah. it's not di- getting you know dilated there it's yes, fixed yes, yes. it's a very thin yes. mucosal ring over there and you below you can see that is the uh, the that is the lower sphincter down there and which has you know the mucosa mucosa has completely changed there is some part of hiatus hernia is there you can see this is the lower sphincter now so above that it's all uh, you know uh, that above that that is the shards gearing so this is this shards gearing is we will not say it's a very symptom uh, symptomatic one un- symptomatic in the in terms when there is not only dysphagia but uh, persistent regurgitation and persistent you know the sim- uh, t- uh, typical reflux symptoms are there so uh, 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 what is the treatment main, mainly gold standard treatment is the endoscopic dilatation so endoscopic dilatation can be done with uh, you know cre balloons or uh, with severi gillard uh, and dilators uh, the second line comes with inter endoscopic dilatation along with intralesional steroid injection endoscopic dilatation with uh, intralesional metomycin c incisional therapy stricturoplasties and esophageal stent placement and surgical intervention as a last option so today uh, we will be more more i'll mane i will focus more on the endoscopic dilatation only uh, because uh, my experience in this field is not that much so uh, so i will just go through with few videos which will uh, it's a therapeutic videos in, the, in cases of uh, isavidal stricture so this is you know it's an algorithm in terms of endoscopic dilatation with severi gillard or balloon for five sessions it has to be done in a 15 days interval is a two weeks interval for a five session is must and after that even if after that there is a persistent symptoms then second line we can go for steroid injections that it has now become into a recalcitrant or a refractory uh, structure so endoscopic dilatation along with metomycin c is there if there is a very short structure incisional therapies can be done for long structure we can give full metal uh, self expanding nitinol stents also there are also there which can be placed even if and sometimes if all fails then at the at the end it's a surgical intervention is required so primary endoscopic management we have severi gillard dilators which comes in various uh, sizes along with this endoscopically guide, guided and it can be used very beautifully that's a, it's a tapered tip so gradual dilatation can be achieved with multiple entries balloon dilatation yeah, these balloons usually come with various sizes from you know uh, from 8 mm diameter to it goes up to 16 to 20 mm diameters so gradually uh, just like uh, the dilators the balloon these balloons are these comes with a pump pressure guided pumps so we have a pressure gauge meter and then we gradually we can shift these balloons are uh, from a smaller size to a gradual a bigger size so these balloons are endoscopically either we can go through the endoscopic channel or there are other balloons which comes with the wire guided which come which goes endoscopic guidance only but that can be fluoroscopically guided 
uh, but that that balloon doesn't passes through the scope so these cre balloons are through the they go through the scope so you get a direct vision of the balloon so there is a uh, diff, uh, just a slight <coughs> differentiation between both the balloon and bougie there are types uh, a balloon as wire guided it's a fixed wire in bougie has the taper tip it's a meloni on the wire guided is severely killed balloons are single use or reusable this is uh, in terms of this is this uh, study has been done in terms of us based i think so they are but in our area we can use the balloon reuse the balloon it's not like a single use balloon so sizes this come balloons comes with as i told uh, as i said that the weight comes in variable size ranges with multiple diameters bougies comes with fixed size but the uh, gradual increase in the uh, diameter advantages are balloon with balloon it's a very very good endoscopic visualization is there and it's very easy to use as uh, if you have uh, you know we, we are we used to take uh, uh, endoscopic biopsies or so in that ways it's a direct under direct visualization very simple to use in terms of buji it is uh, that that is the tactile feel is there so you get to feel uh, feel the, that you have dilated something and it, it doesn't waste as in cases of balloon if there is a very tight structure so the balloon you know balloon will may form a eight like structure but in cases of uh, bougie that 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 may not happen it will completely dilate the esophagus so in mild mid or distal structures short and focal structure balloon is considered in bougies for proximal and long structures or if there is a multiple focal fractures this is how they have classified so this is the uh, two type of balloon in our uh, our hospital we have both the types of balloon this is on the left side this is this is a balloon which uh, comes with a pressure gauge it is uh, it can be used in uh, it is it cannot be used through the scope uh, this is the working channel is not that much it is a wire guided one it has to go alongside with this so because it can be used under direct vision with the endoscope but it goes outside from outside the scope but this on the right side this is the cre balloon it the this balloon it completely goes through the working channel of the uh, gi scope and with the pressure gauge we can gradually you know, push the so dilate the balloon so this is one case uh, this is the first the patient when the uh, patient came to me so this is you see the typical uh, usually what happens the day even though the patient says that she uh, patient has not taken any food uh, since last night but what happens in cases of stricture you you tend to get uh, the food inside the esophagus and very typical finding about that is uh, the food materials you will find there alongside the you will have a, a proximal dilatation of the esophagus you know which we typically find in cases uh, of long stand long standing cases that's why it's uh, in the strictures you will find the proximal dilatation of the esophagus so once i went down i can see the food particle is there this is not a very fresh food this may be it looks like a, it's been there for one or two days the patient had dyspepsia so much of uh, that she she says that even with water the food doesn't pass go goes uh, go down so when i went down the strict uh, there was uh, the lower esophageal sphincter was quite tight you know i could pass through the uh, through the sphincter but with some force but usually it it it, it, it was not like that much opened up it doesn't open up on its own so it was in that shape only and the moment i did that with the esophagus so there was slight tear and slight opening so in that then 
So this is the same case here. You see, uh, this was done after the first dilatation. Right? This is uh, on the the first one is the fresh one. This is the second one is after the first sitting of dilatation. This was taken after a gap of 10 days. I could, at that time, I could easily pass through that. And this is today only. The incident that patient came today for a checkup. So I did an endoscopy. After two sittings, the patient didn't uh, came for follow up. So this time I uh, told them strictly. Then now, now again, uh, that was done in June 2022. And this time they came again after six months and they said, Sir, we will say, I cannot take this page as there. So I told them that you should have come. I have already called you for five sessions, but due to some financial constraints, they, they were not, they, they didn't came. So when I did this today, I could pass through the uh, uh, G junction. But what happened? You can see that whole esophagus is dilated, irregular, and the, even the fluid is there. You know, the fluid is full, full, full of, fully filled with the fluid. Liquid is not going down on its own because the whole uh, peristalsis is not that much good. So with slight gentle pressure, I could pass. This is the I entered into the stomach. So this is the balloon assembly. Uh, sorry. So this is at the sphincter. So this is the guide wire which has gone through the scope. So once guide and guide wire is through the so down the structure, the balloon is passed. So once balloon balloon is placed, we gradually dilate. Uh, inflate the balloon with uh, uh, gradually from lowest pressure to go uh, each every balloon comes with a uh, different uh, you know different gauge of, gauges of pressure so we cannot exert beyond certain pressures so that's why we need different sizes of balloon <laughs> so once the balloon is there we gradually inflate it. The good thing about the uh, balloon is that it is completely transparent. You can, you know, go once. This is the pressure gauge meter. It shows three atmospheres. So once you are into the uh, near, uh, you know, when you inflate inflate the balloon, you can actually see the mucosa down there through this through the balloon whether how much if there is any kind of tear that you have made there and how much it is dilated we can usually actually physically see there so once dilatation has been achieved you see uh,
So balloon is withdrawn. So it's a very good dilatation has been achieved. Now the scope doesn't needs to be pushed that much hard. So it goes well, very beautifully. And this was the first time when I dilated. So the same patient today, this is today's video. So this is balloon assembly. It is the same patient. So after six months, the patient turned up with after two dilatations. Although that's why again it has gone into the same uh, when when it when I saw the first when I saw for for the first time. So this time I have dilated again and again it was after dilatation there was very much good dilatation achieved. You see, so how you see that after in deflation. See how much beautifully it has opened up and there is not much of any tear. So if we go down and we should always look for any tear from inside as well. So when we do a fundoscopy there from inside, there is no tear here, the mucosa. Okay, so that was the case one and this is the case two. Yes, see, there are two videos here. On the same day, the patient came uh, with dysphagia for uh, six months or nine months. So when I did the endoscopy, patient told me that she is empty stomach since last night. So I did the endoscopy. So when I inserted the scope after passing the cricopharynx, this is the cricopharynx. You see. It's all filled up. It's all proximal dilatation. You can see there's all food stuck over there, which is not going down. Apart from food, the whole esophagus, you can see it's a whole smoothly dilated every uh, as a whole. So I was not, uh, although the patient was quite old, so I was not in the doubt that this uh, will be will turn out to be any malignancy because of the typical findings. So I told the patient to wait for another two hours she waited for two hours and then again after two hours i did the repeat endoscopy on same day this is click of pharynx you can see now the food has cleared up I don't know how it cleared up in two hours. Either she vomited out or I don't know, but definitely this is this is this is at the first look, you know, it seems to be like it says the lower esophageal sphincter itself with some ulcers here. I cannot barely pass through, I cannot do anything beyond that. This is barely three to four mm uh, uh, opening over there. So once I saw the scope, it showed that is 30, at 30, I was at 30 centimeter. So it's definitely not the lower esophageal sphincter, but it completely looked like that one. So I immediately, uh, you know, advised for a uh, CT scan just to rule out if there is something down there. But in CT scan, it showed very tight structure, approximately two centimeter in length, and uh, there was no malignant signs of malignancy or anything. So I scheduled for uh, yeah, balloon dilatation the after two days this is an egg white you know on the day when i planned for the uh, dilatation patient had uh, this uh, egg, egg in the last night everything went down but the, this small piece kept uh, stayed there as that patient was under sedation so i had to take it out with the basket first so i just once it was cleared, 
Okay, so once it was cleared, we can see the structure very clearly here. So again, similarly, we went for the balloon dilatation. With gradual dilatation, we do uh, gradually increase the pressure because we don't want to tear it on a single go. So we gradually dilate it. Uh, the one thing is, even though the patient is, if you under sedation as well, once an optimal dilatation is achieved, the patient will have a cough. So, uh, so this is how we can see through the balloon. You know, the mucosal. If there is any mucosal tear because of the dilatation, here we can see that there is not no no tear happening in down. So the balloon, once the balloon was deflated. So after the dilatation, sufficient dilatation was achieved. You know, I can go down at that time. Now, once I went down there, this is the lower is a visual sphincter. And then down into the stomach. There was nothing, any, anything significant down there. But you see, that is the, when I came back, you can appreciate the structure. This is the lower esophageal sphincter. And then again, we come up. Gradually coming up. And this is the structure. So till this patient, I have done uh, two dilatations till now. Patient is uh, tall, has to well tolerated the procedure, so I'm scheduled. I have scheduled for another three sittings. Now patient is uh, having food uh, be better than earlier. Now patient is not having that much of dysphagia, but some discomfort is still there. So we, I, I have planned for another three settings for that. Uh, thank you. That was a short presentation from my side. Andana Vaito. I'll hand over. Okay, Maya, any uh, inputs from your side? No, uh, just just one thing. I think the, was the first case a case of achalasia. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Take it. So you was not a structure uh, actually. Yeah, yeah. We don't consider achalasia as a cause of an esophageal structure. Yeah, yeah. It is basically due to the hyperactivity of the mm -hmm. lower esophageal sphincter, actually. Mm -hmm. So, in that setting, we what we prefer is uh, not a CRE dilatation, but we do what we call a pneumatic dilatation. There is a, a different kind of a balloon for that, which we call, I think it's, it's called a Regiflex. It's a Regiflex. There's an external one. Yeah, 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 it's external, external. is not through the scope. Yeah, it's, a, it, it's not through the scope. We put in a wire first and over the mm -hmm. wire. We usually take the uh, balloon through that. Usually, we can even do it without the wire sometimes. And under the fluoro, we do the dilatation. Yeah, so as, uh, yeah you, we usually do it under fluoro. As uh, the most important part uh, in uh, management of, uh, or rather, should I say, the endoscopic management of the endoscopic structure is the length. Uh, you need to ascertain the length. Just as Dr. Keshav earlier said, we have to uh, identify whether the structure is simple or complex. So the easiest way to do is the length. If the length is more than two centimeters, usually we consider it as a complex structure. For, from the management point of view, it is important. Uh, why? Because the CRE dilatation that, sorry, the CRE dilatation that we do, the length of the balloon is only five centimeters. So you cannot dilate a structure which is more than three centimeters with a balloon. Usually what we uh, advise is to have the, the balloon should be present on both sides of the structure. That right. is only when it will form a waste and the waste when expanded enough will bre break the structure yeah. or cause sufficient dilatation. So the first important point from endoscopic management point of view is the length. If the length is more than three centimeters, we will not be doing a CRA dilatation. Then we will have to go for the bougie dilatation or the fabry gillard dilator. Again, uh, in benign structures which are simple, the second case looked like a peptic structure actually. 
Yeah, so those are kind of the easiest to manage, and those again are very rare to find these days because of the frequent use of uh, proton pump inhibitors. They are not not very common these days, so we don't find them. But as he showed, they are very easy to manage. You know, we usually can use CRD dilatation in them, and after one or two settings, usually the patient responds. And if we can uh, keep the patient on a long term PPI, we usually use a double dose initially of a PPI for about eight weeks, and after that we put it on OD doses. Usually the patient responds. what is uh, most difficult to manage as far as endoscopic management of strictures is concerned are the corrosive strictures which surprisingly you now we don't see here that often during my time in delhi it was you know it was very very common those are the most complex of strictures which can vary in size shape length anything usually we do a bougie dilatation in such things so yeah. that is that the the other thing that dr keshav mentioned initially Like uh, injection of steroids, or uh, there was a term called structuroplasty. You know, we have all tried this, but structuroplasty works sometimes, but the steroid injections not really. They don't work actually. We have used uh, in uh, recalcitrant structures as well, but not with much benefit. But it structuroplasty helps. In structuroplasty, what is done? We actually you know use a cutting knife. We have a ERCP instrument. We call it an NKP needle. with that we can sometimes you know uh, through a you know uh, coagulation um, thing we coagulate actually we use a coagulation force or a cutting force to cut the stricture at four places uh, 3 6 9 and 12 o'clock and along with that we also dilate sometimes so uh, so that is how we do it but again this is usually reserved for very you know refractory strictures which have not been managed adequately through the previous means because the risk of perforation increases yeah and again the duration part we we don't usually call patients at 2 weeks we prefer to call them at 3 to 4 weeks this is because of my experience back there where we mostly dealt with corrosive strictures where the risk of perforation is very very high actually mm-hmm. so we will wait for about you know 3 weeks sometimes even 4 weeks and then call the patients for a dilatation okay Now, particularly, this is about the corrosive ones because corrosive ones, in just like similar in terms of one when we use uh, dilatation in our uh, trachea as well, okay. we uh, we it's like the, the, any mucosal luminal dilatation. If that is because of some corrosive or some underlying uh, different disorder which is not going to settle down, we have to wait for at least three to four weeks. But in benign yeah. peptic structures, particularly in benign peptic structures only. If we what I felt that if we go for a little but frequent dilatations more than you know, so th- the results are much better. Yeah, as I said, this this mostly applies to structures which have a higher risk of perforation. There are two categories actually. One is the caustic or the corrosive one. Mm. The other is radiation structure. Those are also very notorious for perforation. Yeah. These are radiation zone, and these are the very much difficult to manage conservatively. Means yes, in that yes. terms of means very frequently. Very difficult. Very difficult. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, there are uh, some questions in the chat box. <clears throat> Doctor Kuddus Ahmed sir has asked, "What is the structure due to in case of case number one?" Uh, so that was ecclesia. Exactly. Uh, that is ecclesia only, not exactly a structure. Yes. Okay, and Akhil Sharma sir asks uh, structures due to corrosive. Do you Pictures. try corrosive? Oh yes, <laughs> structures due to corrosive. Do you try with uh, corticosteroid uh, in failed cases with dilatation? Do you advise retrograde dilatation? And if it is fails, do you advise bypass operation connecting the pharynx with the stomach? I think my usually, ma'am. Uh, yeah, ma'am. Corrosive strictures, you know, whatever you do, they usually recur. You know, they are very, very bad to manage. Sometimes the yeah. easier ones, yes, we manage with dilatation. As I said, we unless the length is very small, we will prefer a bougie dilatation. The severe gilad ones. Yeah. As far as you know, injection of steroids is concerned, not not very beneficial, ma'am. Yeah. The <clears throat> we have tried, but it does not work to our advantage. as far as you know surgery is concerned usually that again the anastomotic thing depends upon the surgeon some people prefer a colonic anastomosis some will prefer a stomach anastomosis so that depends on the surgeon's preference okay 
Debika Borohar said a very nice presentation, learned about new subject. And Akhil Sharma sir, again, he asks, how many dilatation you advise before doing more drastic measure? Uh, we used to do several dilatation with bougies, gradually increasing in size. Uh, as far as uh, corrosive structure management is concerned, we have, we have a what we call a rule of three. Uh, suppose, you know, by looking at the structure, you get some idea about the lumen of the or the luminal diameter of the structure. So we will not dilate, say, more than three sizes. The 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 fabric lar dilator comes in various sizes. You know, uh, it is it is measured in mm actually seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, or fifteen. So if I can, you know. If I am starting with seven, I will maximum dilate till 11. Means I will use only three dilators. Beyond that, if I use, there is a risk of perforation. As far as the number of sessions are concerned, ma'am, usually our target diameter is 15 mm. We would like to dilate a structure up to 15 mm. Usually we will not dilate a structure. Why? Because patient will patient who has a luminal diameter of about 15 mm will not have significant dysphagia or at best grade one dysphagia where he will have some difficulty swallowing solids. So our aim is 15, and as I said earlier, we usually keep a frequency of about, you know, we call patients about three to four weeks. I would prefer to call them at four weeks or SOS. Whenever the patient feels dysphagia, he can come in. As far as the number of number of dilatations, because we have had very bad experience with surgery, if the patient is not willing for surgery, patient can you know go on to keep on dilating the stitches as and when they want. It is only when we are not able to dilate the strictures beyond 12, 13 mm, where the patient is having significant dysphagia, even after multiple sessions, mm -hmm. usually we would refer the patient for surgery. Okay. Dr. Priyam Sharma, she asks, uh, very uh, she say very nice presentation and she asks any possible complication associated with dilatation? Yeah, only one, perforation. It's very bad <laughs> whenever it happens. Okay. Okay, there is sir. some risk of bleeding, but, but that is less, but mostly perforation, ma'am. Okay. Uh, as Vipukan sir has said, good presentation. And Kostov, he has asked, any encounter with plumar vention syndrome? I've had a few, but very rare, ma'am. Mostly in the really Delhi. Rare. That was also in Delhi. No, not here, not here. Okay. And they but usually was... have webs. They usually have webs. Usually, sometimes these webs can be crossed through the endoscope itself. You know, we don't even need dilated. And <laughs> rarely, if they need dilatation, we do it. But usually, the book says, you know, with the treatment of the iron deficiency anemia, they usually recover. So, usually, the benign condition, not much of a problem. Okay. Uh, Kudu Samet, sir, asks, uh, how do you manage corrosive structures? Because they are generally long structures. Buji dilatation, mostly. Successive bougie dilatation with a target of 15 mm. If a 15 mm target is not achieved after satisfactory dilatation or number of sessions, surgery. Okay. So I will open the forum to Dr. Pukan, sir. Kiba um, Hudibo Niki, sir. Andana, madam. Yes. Can I share one case for yes. Bonte expert? Yes, yes. Okay. If you allow. Yes, yes, I'm allowing you. Please. Um, in the meanwhile, uh, Akhil Sharma sir has asked, congenital structures, do you follow it uh, same protocol? Dr. I Maya? have not had, no ma'am, I have not had, uh, uh, I think we, uh, I'm not very sure. I don't think I have had dilatation with the congenital structure, no. Okay. Yes, so, uh, Dr. Mukesh, uh, uh, Mayank, uh, 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 already you have explained very well regarding corrosive poisoning. This is a case of four years old boy with a 20, last 24, uh, history of 24 year battery injection. Okay. okay. So, this is a esophagus, this is a rigid bronchoscopy, and this is a esophagus. This is esophagus, a esophagus. We can, oh, now we can it's see. Well, huh? And with all these debris and all these things, okay. Luckily, we are um, we type this fine body, not with this. This is open. This is a view by the optical bronchoscope. I use the optical bronchoscope, which I use. Uh, we use mostly for the bronchial fine body, and uh, we could not type the fine body 
uh, with this optical forcep. Later we have conventional forcep. But uh, my uh, what I want to know, what is the next uh, protocol you follow to prevent stick sir? And if there's, uh, how will you how will you follow up this case actually? Yes, immediately uh, after removal of the foreign body. Removal of the foreign body. Sir, so usually it depends upon the time the battery is spent in the desired organ. Like usually, I think the organ the organ here was user figures. Usually, post procedure or the post endoscopic removal management of such cases, you know, we we usually keep the patient uh, nil per nil by mouth for a few days. We give them proton pump inhibitors, even sucralfate. People have even tried steroid. But usually what we have found is that if the degree of injury is higher, then the chances of stick formation are usually, you know, you know, very, very high. There was a grading, if I remember correctly, it's called a Zargar grading. On the basis of that, the incidence of stricture formation is more than 50%. If a patient has Zargar 3B three, three or 3C, three if I'm correct. So here, conservative management usually does not define the outcome. What defines the outcome is the degree of injury. And that will already have would have happened by the time you would, you, you would be receiving or sorry, removing the foreign body. So there is not much we do, but we, we try a lot, but eventually that does not matter. It is the degree of injury that decides the outcome. The immediate poster will you, it is, uh, is always better to put a rice tube. Yes, and yes, yes, sir, that is for, yes. How many, for how many days? So usually, sir, in such cases, we would pull the rice tube for about a week. No, if but the only problem is that sometimes, you know, if you keep it too long, if the structure already developed, then it will not be possible to remove the rice tube sometimes if the structure becomes too tight. But in that case, what happens is that the rice tube will function as a conduit for uh, providing nutrition to the child or the adult or whoever it is. But yes, as I said, we keep the patient nil by mouth for about a week, sir. Okay. So, but, 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 but that you can also decide on looking, suppose you did the endoscopy yourself and you see the degree of injury is not grave enough and you are not expecting a stricture to form gradually. Then you can, you know, usually in Zargar 1 and Zargar 2, we don't keep the rail queue for more than two or three days. If the patient has had an injury which is higher in nature, either I'll put in a rail tube or I will advise a feeding region ostium. Okay. That means uh, we, we basically do follow up endoscopy after seven days. And if you found there's a uh, probability of stick cell, then. No, we, we don't do an endoscopy. Usually, the protocol is to do an endoscopy within the first 72 hours. of a, This is for corrosive cell. We okay. do, uh, this is for corrosive only, not for a foreign body. This, this is a special case, actually. Uh, in a foreign, sorry, in, in a corrosive injection, we, the, the dictum is to do an endoscopy within 72 hours. Rarely we do it up to five days, not beyond that, because there is not much you can do beyond that, you know, and the prime reason for doing an endoscopy earlier is to assess the grade of injury. If the grade of injury is higher, we can assess that the patient will have high sense of structure formation and can refer the patient accordingly for a feeding regionostomy. And if and when the structure happens, we can, you know, go about managing it. But we do not do an endoscopy after five days because it is said that there, because there will be extensive necrosis. If the patient has improved, that means he did not have a significant you know, injury and you can start with, a, say, a trial of liquids if he accepts, you can upgrade. But if the patient has had significant injury and you try to do an endoscopy after five days, you do more harm than good, actually. So we don't do an endoscopy after five days. But preferably, we should limit it to 72 hours. Any rule of honey and all these things for the party, uh, this kind of candidate case group? I'm not aware, sir. I'm, I'm not read, but I'm not aware exactly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome, sir. I think uh, it's time to wind up. Um, thank you, Dr. Mayank, for accepting you, our invitation and uh, for your expert input. And uh, uh, thanks, Dr. Kesha, for taking, uh, uh, it, it was really, uh, truly your um, presentation was lucid presentation. And heads off to you for doing excellent uh, work at your setup with let, let us get you, it. And my sincere thanks to all the viewers and respected teachers, Dr. Kudus Ahmed sir, Dr. S.B. Pukan sir, Dr. Mukherjee sir, Dr. Akhil Sarma sir, for constant encouragement. Good night. 
ओके गुड नाइट थैंक यू थैंक यू एवरीबडी थैंक यू मैं थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू केशव